right, Romans chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 this morning. Now, when we come to church, I'm hoping that you guys come with anticipation and, and, and anticipating that the Lord would speak to you because the Lord has not brought you here to church to waste your time. The Lord does not desire for you to come to church to get your ticket punched and you're like, oh yeah, I did my good deed for the week, you know, or I, I can go the rest of the week with a, with a clear conscience because I went to church on Sunday. I hope that you come to church knowing that God is going to speak to you and that he's going to reveal himself to you and that he's going to encourage you and that he's going to show you things that you've been praying about and and wondering about and he brought you here knowing everything about you and he's going to bless you this morning and so as we segue as we studied chapter one last we finished chapter one last week as we segue into chapter two this morning it's important to note that we are segueing from mankind's complete ruin into something that's a little bit more uh upsetting which is God's complete wrath as we are in a very heavy topic this morning we are looking at verses 1 through well actually 1 through 11 but chapters 1 through about 3 chapter 3 verse 20 is going to be looking at the wrath of God and we're going to see man's complete ruin we're going to see God's wrath but then we're going to step into the good stuff which is why God has given us a remedy and how we receive that remedy for our sin so Last week's study, it should have been extremely sobering for us. And if you missed last week's study, you should definitely review it and look at it because it helps us to have a proper outlook on the realities of life from God's perspective. Uh, we were looking only at the fact that man is sinful, but rather going from the fact to the inevitability of God's wrath coming upon sinful man. Because God's wrath follows man's sin even as night follows day. It's just the way that it goes. So if you sin, you'll be judged by God. And the wrath of God will be poured out upon us. But the whole purpose of even understanding these things, which right off the bat this morning you might be like, wow, the wrath of God and the sin of man. This is insane. But the whole purpose of understanding these things is to help bring us to the realization that we need a Savior. That there is forgiveness there. And that there is a way for us to have a right relationship with God. And that by faith in Jesus, we avoid the judgment of God. And so I don't know about you, but do as I say, not as I do, has never worked for me. I don't know if it's worked for you. Probably not. People know us by our actions. They know us by the way we live and our actions determine whether or not we're all talk or not. Because some of us are all talk and no action. And we are really known by the way we act, not by just what we say. And so Paul, after giving us this list in the end of verse, excuse me, chapter 1, of this list of all these things that are deserving of God's judgment, he now addresses this issue, which is very, very interesting. He addresses the issue of God's wrath. So when I used to live on Maui, and I did, and, and you know, as I've said before, I've suffered for the Lord living in Hawaii for a couple of years, and, and living on Maui, there was this company called Maui Built, and there was these stickers on the back of all of these little Maui beaters that would drive all over, you know, my first, one of my first cars I ever bought was a 1984 Subaru, and I paid two installments of $250, and uh, I bought this car for 500 bucks. Nobody would steal that car, nobody. Like, it, it, was, a, it was a little beater, it drove around, you know, you could really just drive it about three or four miles or so before it would start to over, uh, overheat. It was a six-speed manual transmission, and it was just like to go to work, go surf, and then come back home, and that was it. But you would see on the back of all of these cars these stickers, and it was just it was really peculiar. And, it, and these stickers said, it's all about me. It's all about me. Now, it's one thing to think that, and it's something completely entirely different for you to take a sticker and put that on the back of your car for the entire world to see, that it's all about you. I mean, naturally, we look out for number one. We have no problem in dealing with self-preservation. How do I get ahead? How do I stay alive? How do I succeed? How do I achieve? And for the most part, uh, we look at things from the standpoint of what people do for us or what people do to us. And when we're looking at this sticker, it's like, you know, it's all about me. I was thinking about this, you know, 
a lot of times, probably even most of the time, we deal with what people do for us or what people do to us. And if we are as self-centered as we probably know that we are, you know, everything from who's the first person we look for in the family photo or, you know, who's the one that's saying, I want to eat here or whatever, like we are concerned with ourselves. And if we even don't want to admit it this morning, there is a huge part of who we are that looks out for number one. So we're more concerned with what people do for us or do to us as opposed to what we do for people or what we do to people. That's why we'll say stuff like, I can't believe they do that to me. Who do they think they are? Nobody does that to me. Nobody gets away with that. I cannot believe that they would treat me like that. And we're very, very quick, extremely quick to point out the finger, you know, that, that, that giant, you know, we're number one foam finger pointing out at somebody else. We're so quick to do that. But we're extremely agile in dodging the three that might point back at us. And so in society, you know, in a society that tells us that it's all about you, we make stickers, that it's all about me, and hey, you know, you need to look out for yourself and whatever makes you happy and whatever you want to do and whatever you like, etc. Well, I decided that that would be a great place to start with point number one, which is this this morning if you're taking notes. It's all about you, but just not the way you think. And in verse 1 of Romans chapter 2, it says, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Now there in verse 1, that word therefore is a word that acts like a hinge in connecting two thoughts. This is what is called an illative word, which basically means that you, it infers that you have been given knowledge about something, and so they are referencing back to this given knowledge that you should have, and they're connecting it now with their thought. However, in this case, you might even be able to take that word therefore and replace it with this. For this reason. For this reason. Therefore, you are inexcusable, or for this reason, you are without excuse and in a position that cannot be defended. In this first one here, have you noticed how many times you is mentioned? That word, you. You are inexcusable. Who? You who, who judge. Who? You judge others. You condemn yourself. You judge. You practice the same things. The emphasis, the responsibility is placed upon Y-O-U. You. And so that's why we had point number one. It is all about you, but not the way that you think. See, when you acknowledge that what someone is doing is wrong and condemn them, but do yourself, you are actually making yourself responsible in knowing that those actions are wrong. How many times have we condemned someone for doing something wrong? And the very fact that we recognize that as being wrong, it testifies. It testifies to the fact that we have a God-given conscience. It's a natural recognition of the existence of sin itself. And so what we're dealing with here are two specific groups. We're going to look at the downright sinful, wicked person. And then we're going to look at the relatively good person who does the same types of sinning, but with class and style and with affluence and with refinement or with secrecy. Because you'll see people that live just these debased lifestyles and you might say, man, that is a bad person. Look at them. You know, they're living on the streets and they're addicted to this drug or whatever. You know, it's like I've, I've, I've run into so many people, you know, that have thought bugs were crawling out of their faces because they were on meth or, you know, they're addicted to heroin. A lot of even uh, of us here, we have family members and friends that have been involved with addictions like that. And you might look at people that are, you know, they're in prison and they're, you know, they're robbing banks with machine guns and all this kind of stuff. And you might think, well, that's wicked. But we judge others for the very same thing that we do ourselves. You know, the wicked woman breaks up the marriage. You know, the moral person stays married but commits adultery in his heart. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28, I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
I mean, honestly, how bad do other people's sins look to us? Ah, I can't believe they would do such a thing. How could they do such a terrible, wicked thing? Yet when we do such a thing, it's not that bad. You know, we rationalize it, even justify it, you know, justify our sin because, you know, we're different. You know, there were extenuating circumstances that that caused me to do this certain thing. Not like those people over there, they're just wicked, but I did the same thing, but, you know, there was a reason for it, you know, and I was just having a bad day or whatever you might say. (laughs) Very, very interesting. Very interesting, isn't it? You know, we realize that something's wrong in somebody else's life, but then we ignore it in our own lives. The very observation of something being wrong in somebody else's life means that it's actually wrong for you as well. For me to say that something is wrong means that I'm also condemning myself if I'm doing the same thing that I'm saying that is wrong. Well, so does this mean that, and I, and I know in our own minds, we'll jump right away to this, this particular scenario. Well, does that mean that I don't ever say anything is wrong so then I'm not condemning myself when I do the same type of wrong things? You know, if I don't really come down on people for doing wrong things, then, you know, then, 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 then I might not have to deal with those certain things. Well, no, absolutely not. See, what should happen, though, is the very fact that we realize something as being evil should serve as a warning against us doing the same thing so if something is pricked in your heart where you're like that's not right that should not only serve as a reminder hey that's wrong and you have a conscience and you can recognize sin but it should also serve as a warning for us that if I see something's wrong it should be warning me you don't want to do that same thing and secondly it should move us to showing the same type of love to the wrongdoer that we would like to be shown Someone screws up, messes up, sins, you know, we're quick. The natural human response to someone's evil doing is to make them pay. Man, they're going to get it for that. They're going to pay for that. Oh, man, I can't wait till they get what's coming to them. What goes around comes around, and I can't have it come around fast enough for those people. They're going to get theirs. Retribution. You know, I thought that would be a great name for a hardcore band. Retribution. You know, wrath. No mercy, pain. And we feel like denying those people that have done wrong everything we would plead for if we were the guilty party. Right? Because if the shoe was on the other foot and we had messed up and someone was coming down on us, we'd be like, please, I beg you, I'm sorry, please give me a chance. But we don't want to do that when it's somebody else messing up. And so we need to understand today that life is all about you but not the way you think. Because God will hold you accountable for your actions regardless of what someone else has done to you. Regardless of what other people have done, God holds you accountable. That's why point number one was it is all about you. Because Paul opens up this letter saying, do you realize that when you do this, you're doing that and then you'll get this? And so when you start thinking about how I interact with people and how I treat other people, you realize, man, I have a lot to work on myself. I have a lot to focus on with the things that I struggle with and the areas that I'm weak in. And that if I want to be receiving grace, I need to be showing grace, which leads us to point number two. So number one was, hey, it is about you and you being accountable for your actions and what you do. And point number two is it's all about you and others. So change the way you think. Point number one, it's all about you, but not the way you think. Not about being self-centered, not about being self-focused, not not about being just concerned with yourself. It's about you being very aware of your responsibility for your actions. And when you're aware of the responsibility for your actions, then that changes the dynamic interpersonally in our relationships. When I'm aware that what I do I'm responsible for, and the way I even look at other people, I'm responsible for those things as well. That that is something that serves as an impetus for us to change the way that I think when I deal with me and other people. So point number two, it's all about you and others, so change the way that you think. Because so often we will find ourselves in situations where 
uh, let's just, well, quite frankly, you're attacked. You're attacked. We can have our philosophy of life attacked, and we might have a strong case for what we believe. And if it's too strong of an argument, people will, will stop, uh, uh, you know, they, they'll change their tactic, which in Latin is called ad hominem, which basically means you attack the man. You don't attack their argument anymore, you attack the person himself. And you'll see this, you know, in the debates that are on TV where it's no longer policy that they're discussing, they start attacking the person. This is the ad hominem tactic, where you attack the man. You know, and it's like somebody will say some point and you're like, oh yeah, well, you just believe that because you're stupid, you know, or something like that. So you're not even arguing points anymore, you start attacking the person instead of their position. And sometimes people will say the most terrible untrue things about us oh, they just say some mean things so terrible that we feel like we don't want to show up to school because we walk down the hallways and everybody's looking at us and they've heard you know these untrue things about us or we don't even want to show up to work because we're going to walk into that group and they're all talking and they're all thinking these lies about me and I don't even think I even want to be there but back in point number one we looked all we looked we looked back at like how do you treat people what are you doing? How are you treating others? And especially, how do you treat them if they've wronged you? Because if you are judging somebody who's doing something wrong and you've, do, and you've done or doing the same thing, then you are basically condemning yourself. Are you measuring out that by which you would not like to be measured by? Think about that. Every time this sort of thing comes up, it's important to especially make clear that God is the one who will judge and condemn. We're not the authority. We're not the authority. However, this passage is not saying that we are not to stand for what is righteous and in so doing separate ourselves from what is unrighteous. Jesus actually spoke more of hell and the judgment of God than any other person or in any other place in the entire Bible. So the issue, please don't get it twisted, is not whether we should or should not tell someone what they're doing is wrong for there is a place for that, but how do we do that? Is it done in love? Is it done in sincerity, with concern for the individual? Or are we like those who, that it says of in Romans 1.32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Are we condoning? Are we approving the evil actions of other people? Because some people say, don't judge me, man. How many times have we heard that? 15 million times. And we don't understand what that really means. We don't understand that we are to hold back people that are stumbling to the slaughter, so to speak. Like if the bridge is out and you're driving your car over the edge, you better believe, man, you would hope to believe that there would be somebody there saying, hey, man, the bridge is out. You know, it's blocking it off. You know, the, 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 the police officers have come and the fire trucks have come. Don't drive this way because it will lead to your death. Don't judge me, man. If I want to drive down this road, I can if I want. No, and so often we don't understand what that means. We don't, understand, we don't get it. Because we need to understand that we're responsible for our actions. We're responsible for how we treat other people. And there are people that come across as you are the worst person known to man, you're going to hell. Well, you may be the worst person known to man, and you may be on the path that's heading to hell, but I can tell you right now that that approach is probably not going to go over too well. The people that are concerned for somebody else's well-being, they will speak forth the truth in love because they know that there is a God who will judge. And I hope that we're not like those in Romans 1.32 where we approve, hey, go ahead, man, that's fine, whatever floats your boat. I don't think that's what we should be doing. But let's get back on track. But what about those people who have hurt us and are slandering us? Remember, because it's all about you and others, so we need to change the way we think. Look at verse 2. But we know that the judgment of God, 
This is God's judgment. We're not talking about man's judgment. We're talking about God's judgment and God's wrath upon sin. So it says that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. In Hebrews 9.27 it says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. You stand before God. And one thing we know is that the judgment of God is inevitable. Another thing that we know is that it is just. And then thirdly, we see from verse 2 in Romans 2 that it is according to truth. It's according to truth. And this is extremely important for how we interact with other people. Now, in my life, just on a personal note, I have been the victim of some pretty serious slander where people were saying very, very terrible things about uh, and untrue things about me. And I remember it was in high school. And you know, in high school, that can be an especially difficult time. But you know what? In life in general, I don't think any of us really like when people are lying about us and saying untrue things about us and saying things that are terrible. But it's hard not to be hurt by those things. And it's even more difficult to try to not defend yourself. Like, how can I put out 15 million fires? You know, what if the slander goes viral? How are you going to even, even put that? How do you even handle those kind of things? And when I say it's difficult to not try to defend yourself, I'm not saying that you're to be someone's doormat and that you're never to stand up for what's right because I think just honestly and even intellectually we should understand that these certain things where we say, oh, don't defend yourself, what does that mean? Some people run with that and they're just, it's unintelligent. We don't, we don't want to be guilty of that. You know, we're not to be somebody's doormat. We're not to, there, there's never uh, a way for us to say where you can't ever stand up for what is right. What I am saying is that the Lord is your defense. He is the one that is your defender. Because so often we can spend countless hours, days, months, years, and even lifetimes trying to defend ourselves or putting out every little fire. And that, my friends, is exhausting, and I know from personal experience. In our first verse, we looked at our view of others. We looked at our view of others, but in this verse, and the following, we're looking at others' view of us because God knows the truth, and his judgment is according to the truth. Living in this life is about me and other people that I interact with. I need to change the way that I think by realizing that God knows the truth. Because it says his judgment is according to truth. It's according to truth. God knows the matters of the heart. And he knows the motivation by which things are done. No matter what lies may be spoken or printed or broadcast or in this day and age posted. The Lord judges according to truth, not according to hearsay, not according to popular opinion, not according to the most convincing argument. He judges according to truth. So you take care of yourself. You be accountable to God for your actions. Because the way that you live and what you do, it affects other people. So we need to understand that it is about us, but not the way we would think selfishly. It's about having a realization and an understanding, even as I've said before, an awareness of your actions and the responsibility for those actions. And if you're doing the same thing that you recognize as something is wrong, as something as wrong in somebody else's life, you're condemning yourself. And that should change the way we interact with other people. It should change the way that we treat other people. And it's a good thing that God judges according to truth. And if that's the case, which we know to be true, then verse 3 and point number 3 is this. It's all about you and God, and respectfully, it doesn't matter what you think doesn't matter. If it's all about you and, you need, and, and it's not the way you think, and if it's all about you and others and you need to change the way you think, and then number three, it's all about you and God, and it doesn't matter what you think. This is interesting right here in verse three. It says, and do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? There are no exceptions to the rules of God. None. How many times have we said this or something to this effect? But he did this to me first. But she started it. Well, I finished it. Well, why do we think that two wrongs make a right? 
I don't know if your parents ever said that to you growing up, but I heard that all the time. Two wrongs don't make a right now. Two wrongs don't make a right all the time, especially with my brothers. We were all two years apart, and we did everything together. Sports, we fought all the time. We fought a lot. We were, we were in martial arts, and we would practice our moves on each other. You know, tap, submit, you know, like that kind of thing. And there we would be, all lined up. There's me. I'm the oldest. And there's Torn. And then there's Britton. And my dad would ask us these, que- <laughs> these questions every single time. Remember, we're all there and we're kind of angry at each other. And we're all standing there. We'd be so you know, riled up, so upset. You know, we've been fighting you know, or something. You know, my dad would say, well, did you hit him? Did you pour the bowl, the bowl of cereal on his head? Did you throw him over the banister wrapped in a sleeping bag? You know, that kind of brotherly stuff. For those of you that have brothers, you know about that. Yeah, but, and my dad would stop us right there. He didn't even let us talk. Yeah, dad, but, no, you stop right there. But he did this. Aren't you going to punish him, dad? Aren't you going to take care of that? You know, dad, you should take away all of his video games. You should not let him play with any of his friends. For a whole week, he should be grounded. And we'd start rattling off, you know, these, you know, the verdicts, the judgment of what should happen to the brother. And my dad would always say, I'm talking about your actions and I'll get to your brother next. And do you think this, oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Needless to say, we are very good at measuring out punishments that our brother should get, but not realizing That we were sentencing ourselves and our mouths sealed our own doom. Let's take this now to a spiritual standpoint. The spiritual relational standpoint with God. Our ideas of what is wrong with someone else is self-condemning. If we're practicing the very thing that we have condemned in other people's lives, you better believe that that's an area that God's going to hone in on in your life. In verse 4, do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance or to turn from your sin? That word goodness means moral goodness or kindness or integrity. And in Psalm 145, verse 17, it says, The Lord is righteous in all of his ways, gracious in all his works. The next thing we saw there is the Lord is forbearing. Forbearance, it means tolerance. Wow. In the original language, it can mean tolerance. Isn't that an interesting word to be used in describing the Lord? Because we hear about this all the time. Tolerance, 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 right? God allows people to curse him, spit upon him, defame him, and just about every other imaginable evil thing that mankind can do to insult him. Yet he bears with mankind in all their failures. In our world where there are certain people groups crying out tolerance, 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 they fail, to, they fail to realize that that is exactly what God has been giving them in their evil ways. But so many times we think that tolerance is acceptance. Tolerance is condoning because God's not condoning. He is not approving, nor is he accepting. But he is tolerating, he is forbearing. And you might think, well, why does he do that? Why doesn't he just wipe those people off the face of the earth? Smite them, O Lord. You know, like that kind of thing. You know, David would cry out like that in the Psalms all the time about his enemies. Smite them, O Lord. Smash them, destroy them. Why doesn't God just wipe them out? Because he is the third thing we saw there. In verse 4, is he's long-suffering, which means patient or having endurance or perseverance. And in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, or his promises, some count slackness. Some people think, like, why is God just not wiping these people out? But is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There are people today that are living wicked, evil lives and they're, they're successful. 
And they're thriving. And they're healthy. And we think that God is approving or is okay or doesn't care. But that is not the case at all. God will judge righteously and according to truth. And it's his goodness that holds out to the bitter end in order to give those that are away from him a chance to come to him. Isn't that just hard to even believe? The reason why it's so hard to believe is because we sit here right now and we think about the evil people that are in the world. And we think, why doesn't God wipe them out? And there we are, condemning ourselves. Aren't you glad that God was patient with you? Aren't you glad that God's goodness and kindness led you to turn from your sin? Aren't you glad that God has held out for so long instead of smiting you that he has given you these chances? Because when you think about it, and honestly, to be true to the text means you need to see things for what they are. Recognizing that something is sinful isn't wrong. God has given us a conscience, and if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the things that grieve the Lord grieve us. There is a place to stand for what is right, to proclaim that which is, you know, to acknowledge, hey, those things are wrong. You shouldn't be doing those. Those things are evil. They're going to hurt you. They're hurting other people. And you should do that. But when we come to this passage of scripture and we're looking at God's wrath and you're looking at his character and you're thinking the Lord holds out waiting to the last second please come to me because he's desiring it says some people think oh he's slack no he's not slacking off it says he's desiring that none should perish but that all should come to repentance and it says in his goodness that he holds out to the bitter end but even though God is All these things, as it says, it's his goodness and it's his forbearance and it's his long suffering. It says, even though God is all of these things to us, in verse 5 it says, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. It's about you, it's about you and others. And most importantly, it's about you and God. And if we spent more time worrying or rather being concerned about our own right standing before God, this world would be, our life would be a much better place. It says your hard heart to the things of God in verse 5. And your lack of repentance, that is what is storing up for you, heaping up, accumulating the wrath of God. He says repentance. He says your impenitent heart. Repentance is turning from your sin. Some people say that they cannot commit to the Lord. I just can't make a commitment to the Lord. Well, let me ask you this this morning. What if you were in a relationship that you couldn't commit to? Do you think that that relationship would work out all right? You know, girls, if you had this guy, he's like, man, I'm really into you. I, I think you're so attractive. I really like being with you, but I just can't commit to you. I mean, commitment is vital. And there are people today that say, I just can't commit. Well, listen, commitment to follow Jesus is serious and is necessary because God will render out judgment according to our deeds. I need to commit my life to following Jesus. Because if I just think, oh man, I can just do whatever I want and you know the Lord will pursue me. And yes, God does pursue you. Yes, the conviction of the Holy Spirit will go after you. And remember, we looked at that God's Spirit though won't always strive with man. There is a point where if that's the way you want to go, then go for it. I don't know where that point is. Only God knows. But the thing is, is that people are so afraid of commitment. So afraid of commitment. When commitment to God is the most important commitment that you could ever make in your entire life. I've committed my life to read the Bible, to believe what it says, and to apply it to my life. Like, is that our commitment as Christians? Or is it like, hey, I kind of live in a culture where going to church is kind of what you're supposed to do, and it makes my grandma in Washington mad if I don't go to church, and she calls me every Sunday afternoon, you know, or whatever it might be, and... 
that kind of thing? Is, is, or is church something like, hey, the Bible says do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. So the Bible says don't stop going to church. So I need to be in church. I know that's the right thing because it's honoring to God. It's honoring to his word. I've committed my life to the Lord. So as he said, be holy for I'm holy. I strive to, in the power of the Holy Spirit and him strength, him strengthening me to be like Jesus. To be like him. And Paul explains further here in our next verse, verse 7. He says, An eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Now, if you read verses 5 and 6 and 7 together, and you even look back all the way at at, at verse 4, and we're talking about God's character, but in verse 7, I want to maybe set something where you've not ever thought about this before judgment isn't a bad thing unless you've done a bad thing judgment isn't a bad thing unless you have done a bad thing i mean people say oh the righteous judgment of god oh dear you know what am i going to do well what if you stood before the judge and you were awarded $50 million in punitive damages, would you be afraid of that judge ruling righteously? You were the victim. It is clearly stated in all the facts in Exhibit A through Z. It all is laid out. And the judge with his gavel goes, boom, I find you to be in the place where you are awarded $50 million in damages. Would you be afraid of that judgment? I would say not. See, God will judge and rule for some eternal life. And there's no fear in that ruling. Man, God, the righteous judge of the universe, is going to rule. I rule. You have eternal life. Man, that kind of judgment from God, that's the, yeah, that's great. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not fearful of that. And so people think, oh, the judgment of God is so terrible. It's only terrible if you're guilty. And if you're forgiven of your sins because you've had faith in Jesus, then your sins are no longer associated with you because Jesus paid the price for your sin. And so when the judgment of God comes down, you are the one who wins. But... Verse 8, to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, meaning those people that were close to, uh, to the, in the religious sense to God, those that were the furthest away. But glory, verse 10, honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. From these verses, the first thing that I'd like to say is this. I cannot work that which is good until the Lord first works that which is good into me. I cannot work that which is good until the Lord first works that which is good into me. And there are some Christians that will hear something like this, something that talks about Christians doing good works, and they'll say, aha! Just like that. Aha! You're trying to say that people have to do good works in order to be pleasing to the Lord, and it's not about grace anymore, and it's about works, and all this kind of stuff. Well, listen to me very clearly. By grace... You have been saved through faith in Jesus. And it's not of works, lest anyone should boast that they worked themselves into heaven. However, upon saying that, if I belong to a heavenly kingdom, then I should be living as if I am a citizen of that kingdom. Does that make sense? People talk about Christians working. Listen, we're not working for our salvation. Because we could never earn our salvation. 
It's through faith in Jesus that we're saved. However, if I am saved, then the way that I should be living, the way that I should be working, should be exemplifying that. So many people say, man, I got my ticket punched, and then they live. They say, I'm a Christian. I went forward at this event. I prayed the sinner's prayer, whatever it might be. But then they live as if they are a non-Christian. They live as if they don't have a relationship with the Lord. And I think and I hope that we'd all say that there's probably something wrong with that picture. So when we talk about Christians doing good things, it isn't saying earn your way to heaven. It's about showing that you are a member of that kingdom. That heavenly kingdom. So it is about me, but not the way we would normally think. It is about me and others, so I need to change the way that I think about my interactions with them, and it is about me and God, and respectfully, it doesn't matter what we think, because as it says in our closing verse, in verse 11, there is no partiality with God. That's it. The playing field is level for all of us. My actions the way I treat other people, my relationship with God. See, the emphasis is on you understanding your proper place because, you know, sometimes we come down so hard on people and, and we're so, so, and from a heart standpoint, judgmental, not even that we're concerned that, hey, we want to help you or that you're miserable or that there's a better way. It's just dropping the guillotine on them. And, and that's a matter of the heart. And that comes across. But then we fail to realize that if I'm treating somebody like that, I'm condemning myself. If I'm coming down like this on you, then you better believe that you're not going to escape God's judgment in your life in that area. And so all of a sudden, it should cause all of us as Christians in the church to take one step back, reevaluate your walk with the Lord. Where am I at? Am I seeking the Lord? Am I doing what I should be doing? How am I interacting with people? How am I treating them? This isn't saying you don't tell somebody what they're doing is wrong because that would be unloving. That would be cruel to have somebody that you care about doing something that's going to hurt them and you turn a blind eye to it or furthermore legislate it or, hey, empower them to do it. That's not what God's called us to do, so don't, don't even think that in your mind because some people say, you're judging me, you're telling me what I'm doing. Listen, God's the judge. He's the one that will render to each according to his deeds, not me. I love you. I care about you, and that's why I'm saying it. So take it for what it's worth. It's found here in the Bible. I love you. I want to help you. And then let the Lord do the work in those people's lives because he's the one that can change. But if we just let people just go over the cliff, what kind of Christians are we? Really? So when somebody says, hey, don't you judge me, don't judge me, and what they're really trying to do is deflect any kind of conviction or any kind of acknowledgement or any kind of responsibility that it's all about them and their actions. Don't tell me, you know, you, you did that wrong thing last week. Hey, that's true, and I know I've sinned and I've done wrong things, and that's why I've asked God to forgive me and he's helping me. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I don't make mistakes. But I'm saying that there's a God in heaven who loves me and who has sent his only son to die on the cross for me and he changed my life and I know that he can change yours too. Because it is all about you and it is all about how you interact with others but most importantly, it's all about you and God. And that's where we conclude today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and we thank you, Lord, for giving us understanding of what your word says. And so, Lord, today, I pray, God, that as your word tells us that you will render each according to his deeds for there is no partiality with you, I pray that we, Lord, would be right with you. And I pray for any that are here this morning, Lord, that do not know you personally. Lord, I pray, God, that they would know how much you love them. And Lord, that you truly did, historically documented fact, send Jesus to die on the cross for their sins because you love them. Because you hold out, Lord, until the very, very last moment 
to pour out your wrath because you desire that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. And so, Lord, I pray that if there are any here this morning, Lord, that need to turn from their sin, maybe they've been living a lifestyle that is sinful, it's against you, Lord, and they know it. I pray that this morning they would ask you to forgive them. And with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here this morning and maybe, you know, you're in that place and you're there seated seated in your seat and you're thinking after hearing these things, man, I need to be right with God. I can't work my way into heaven. I need faith in Jesus. I I need a change. I want you to know that that change is possible regardless of your upbringing, regardless of what people have told you, regardless of what lies people have said about you, regardless of even what lies you began to believe about yourself. Maybe you've had people close to you telling you that you're worthless or that you're trash or that you're not worth anything because of certain things that you've done. Well, know this, that God knows all of those things. He knows every detail of your life, every sin, every wrong thing you've ever done, and he still sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. Because it was about you and his great love for you. And so this morning with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here and you need to recommit your life to the Lord because you walked away. Maybe you grew up in a Christian home and you're like, man, I was raised religious, but you know, I, I'm just kind of learning and trying to figure out where I am. Today's the day where you need to give your life to Jesus. Personally commit your life to him. And if you've, if you've never done that, and you like to give your life to Jesus this morning, you like to be forgiven of your sins, then I'm going to ask you with every eye closed and head bowed, would you just raise your hand wherever you're at and say, yes, that's me. i like to give my life to Jesus today. Anybody else, just hold your hand up so I can pray for you. I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. God bless you guys over there. Anybody else, just raise your hand. And if you've walked away from the Lord and you're like, man, I needed to hear this today. I need to get back on track. Then would you raise your hand today too and say, yes, that's me. I need to recommit my life to Jesus. Today's the day of salvation, not tomorrow, not later tonight, right now, this is your chance. If the Lord's speaking to your heart, raise your hand and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be empowered by the Spirit. I want to have my sins forgiven. Anybody else, just raise your hand right now, because I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. Father, I pray for these that have raised their hands, Lord, and even those watching this service live right now, or that may watch it at a later time that are committing their life to you, they have that desire, or coming back to you right now. I pray, Lord, that you please help them as they say this prayer of faith, believing, Lord, that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. And for those of you that raised your hands, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. I'm going to ask you just to repeat it after me and meet it in your heart and say this. Dear Jesus, I know that I have sinned, but I ask that you would forgive me of my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you love me, even knowing all the wrong things that I've done. I thank you that you've died on the cross for me, and I thank you that you have forgiven me of all my sin. Would you fill me with your love and your joy and your peace and give me your strength to be who you've created me to be for I give you control of my life today. In Jesus' name, amen.